Good day. My name is Michael Barber and I'm an Associate Professor of Instructional Design for the College of Education and Health Sciences at Toro University, California. And I'm going to talk a little bit today about what should have happened in the K-12 system for the fall as well as what we can do to address that situation now. However, before my formal presentation, I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement. Toro University, California is located on the former Mare Island Naval Shipyard in Vallejo, California. The university is included as a part of one of the unratified 1851-1852 treaties, specifically part of Area 296 of Treaty O. The university itself sits on unceded land of the Karkin people, one of the eight Ohlone tribes in the Bay Area. Solano County was also home to different tribes of the Miwok as well as Patwan people. To properly situate this conversation, it's important to look at what happened this past spring as well as what has happened so far this fall. So if you remember back to this past spring, as things started to close down in March and as a system, K-12 schools began to look at how they were going to serve their students and their families, one of the things that quickly became apparent was that the actual act of teaching and learning that happened in school was fairly high up on the pyramid when we looked at all of the other functions that school performed. So K-12 schools were actually focused upon greater needs for the communities that they serve before focusing upon teaching and learning. When they did focus upon teaching and learning, what we saw were teachers that began to create learning spaces in any small portion of their home that they could fit that kind of environment into and to try to provide some continuity of learning for our students. And in instances where students weren't able to access that teaching and learning because they didn't have a device or reliable bandwidth, teachers went to their students and would do things like produce activities in chalk that they could do on their driveways or teach them in their own homes through a storm door. What occurred during the spring has been described by many as an emergency situation, and like any emergency, teachers triaged it as best they could, and our hats off to all of them for the job that they did. Turning our attention to the first few months of the fall semester, what we've seen is departments of education around the country were relatively late in terms of a planning cycle in releasing guidance for school districts and schools to use to plan for the fall semester. And when they did release those guidance documents, in many cases, they simply provided advice on things that the district or the school wanted to be aware of or needed to figure out as opposed to trying to lay out specific guidelines to help the schools follow the advice from public health agencies like the CDC. As some schools returned to face-to-face -face learning, we saw physical distancing as students arrived. We saw temperature checks as students arrived and throughout the day. We saw teachers rearranging their classrooms to ensure that students were physically distanced. We saw portions of the school schedule, such as recess and lunch, redesigned to ensure that students interacted with fewer of their peers. In instances where physical distancing wasn't available, we saw students wearing masks or other protective measures put in place to decrease the amount of interaction that they could have with each other. Some schools were able to utilize large open areas as well as outdoor settings. And when it comes to remote learning, we've tended to focus strictly upon online learning, which has exacerbated any digital equity issues that were in place. So many students have not been able to access that online learning. One of the reasons why we focused upon online learning is because so many schools have placed such a premium upon synchronous instruction 
requiring all students to log in online at the same time in order to access their instruction in real time from a teacher who is delivering the lesson through Zoom or Teams or Meets or some other synchronous tool. This focus on synchronous instruction has led to media reports that we've all seen where students have had to walk to school in order to access the Wi-Fi because they didn't have internet at home or had to sit outside some fast food establishment so that they could take advantage of their free Wi-Fi. And as you might expect, this has hit those students who are in the lowest socioeconomic status harder than any other group of students. And far too few schools have engaged in strategies such as the one indicated in this news item to address those students who did not have access to reliable internet. The end result in all of this is thousands of students that are being lost through the cracks and are simply unable to attend school in the way in which it has been provided for much of the fall. Another issue that the reliance on online learning has created is a lack of concern for social-emotional learning. And we continually see traditional and social media posts that highlight the fact that students are struggling in this kind of environment to engage with their teachers and their classmates in a meaningful way Beyond all of the issues that we've seen with students, we are also experiencing issues with teachers. Many of our best teachers who've been part of the system for years have made the difficult decision to either resign or take leave of absences, in many cases simply because they fall into one of the high-risk categories for contracting the coronavirus, making the difficult decision on whether to continue to teach in the classroom, even with a reduced number of students, and risk getting the virus, or simply removing themselves from the situation. For those that have been teaching in a online or hybrid way, too many of them have reported the simple fact that they weren't prepared or trained or provided professional development to be able to use these tools, to be able to support students and parents in their use of the tools, or to be able to teach effectively using these tools. Additionally, the model that many schools have adopted, one in which students are taught in the classroom at the same time that lesson is streamed to students who are also learning at home, is a flawed model simply because it ties the teacher to a device within the classroom which prevents them from actively engaging with the students that are in the room, or they are actively engage with those that are in the room and neglect those that are online whom they're supposed to be teaching at the same time. The lack of adequate training as well as the additional workload of having to teach either online or in a hybrid fashion is causing many of the teachers that have decided to remain within the system to report feeling burnt out. In fact, in recent weeks, I've noticed in my social media streams that many teachers report to feeling February tired, even though it was only the end of October. Myself, I have been quite critical of the leadership at the district level for their lack of planning to address these many concerns, most of which were identified during the spring semester while we were dealing with the initial stages of this emergency. The summer months should have allowed these district leaders to better prepare for a fall reopening that would have addressed many of these issues. Because while there is still much that we are learning about this coronavirus, in many cases on a daily basis, there is one thing that we know about pandemics from over a thousand years worth of history with them. Pandemics come in waves, and while we don't know exactly what those waves would look like, there was a guarantee that at some point during the 2020-21 school year that there would be some form of disruption. 
It may have happened at the beginning of the school year. It may have happened during the fall. It may have happened over the winter. It may have happened when cold and flu season came around, but it was going to happen at some point. So that brings us up to the present and the question of what should have happened in the fall. As I indicated earlier, one of the things that was an absolute requirement was some sort of plan in place. Because one of the things that we do know about pandemics is that they do come in waves. So while we weren't sure whether or not we would be impacted at the beginning of the 2020-21 school year, or if it would happen at some point during the 2020-21 school year, we knew that it was going to happen at one stage or another. This here is a useful graphic that was created by Philip Hill of Mine Wires. And it's interesting because the graphic, even though it was created for higher education, really is applicable to much of the broader education system, including the K-12 system. What's even more interesting is that the graphic was created at the end of March 2020. So it was prior to the time that we would have seen exactly how the spring played out or exactly what was going to happen in the summer or at the beginning of the new school year in the fall. What this graphic illustrates is that when we made the quick pivot to remote learning or emergency remote learning in March, that most schools were caught unprepared for this kind of environment so that teachers essentially did what came easiest to them. So once they did start to teach again, for the most part, it was a reliance upon synchronous instruction. As they begin to get comfortable in that remote teaching environment, they started to add back in some of the tools that they were familiar with already, things that they might have been using with their students in a blended environment within their classrooms. And it's that phase two that would have taken us to the end of the 2019-2020 school year. So what we needed to do in order to be prepared for the 2020-21 school year, to be prepared for the fall school reopening, was essentially to plan for a variety of options. As you can see here in the graphic, in phase three, they talk about being in a position where students could be supported in the classroom, in an online setting, or going back and forth between the two. And that's why you see that transition of the line going up and down, up and down throughout the early parts of 2020. What this does illustrate in a very clear way is that in that third phase, we needed to prepare so that we weren't caught in this scrambling mode that we saw occur in March and April of last year. Again, with a focus on higher education, Brian Alexander posted the three ways in which the fall semester might unfold. The first was a post-COVID campus where essentially the pandemic had already run its course and we were able to resume operations as normal. The second one was one where we had to begin as well as run the entire semester in a remote learning context. And then the third was a toggle term, as he called it, one where we would spend some time in the classroom, some time learning at a distance, and we would be flipping back and forth between the two, depending upon the local context of the pandemic at that particular time. Now, because this was based upon a higher education context, one of the things that Brian didn't account for was the fact that within the K-12 context, the students are minors. So there were also issues related to parental supervision that needed to be factored into that toggle term planning. So what exactly should that planning have looked like? The slide in front of you outlines the three groups that I think could have done a better job at planning and exactly what I think should have happened. First, departments of education had a critical initial role in this process and that began with providing guidance early on. In most cases, state and federal public health authorities had already outlined various suggestions for how schools should operate. And the onus was up on departments of education to take that guidance and to put it into language that school districts could use directly. Additionally, many jurisdictions around the world operate on a year-round schooling system that begins in January and runs through to December. What that meant was that in 
May and June, as the pandemic started to subside in some of those jurisdictions, they were able to go back to school and able to operate school in the months of June and July and August. And the lessons that they learned in that operation should have been things that departments of education in the United States would have used as part of their guidance to schools and school districts. Additionally, the departments should have provided this guidance early. By early, I'm suggesting as early as May, and if it was provided after June, I think it was provided too late for school districts to do any meaningful planning using those documents and be able to incorporate it to be ready for a fall start. Beyond providing guidance to schools and school districts, I believe departments of education should have examined the curriculum for continuity issues. The reality of the 2019-2020 school year was the fact that much of the year was disrupted. As of the middle of March, most school systems closed down, in many cases for weeks at a time before they were able to get some semblance of remote learning in place. And even then, much of that remote learning was scattershot and deployed in ways in which some students had access and some students didn't. Depending on the nature of the school system, this meant that some students missed as much as a third of their school year. Almost all students would have missed at least 20% of the instruction that they would have normally gotten during that year. Now, for a student who is in grade 5, that means that they're starting grade 6 in the 2020-21 school year, having only gotten between 66 and 80% of the learning outcomes that they were supposed to get in grade 5. It should have been the role of the Department of Education to go through that grade 5 curriculum and figure out which of those learning objectives were necessary for curriculum continuity purposes. By that, I mean which of those outcomes were necessary for students to be able to understand content that they were going to have to do in grade 6, and what curriculum outcomes, what learning outcomes were there because they were age-appropriate for well-rounded citizens to be able to know, do, or understand. Similarly, for the grade 6 curriculum, you've got a group of teachers now in the 2020-21 school year that have to go back and cover some of those grade 5 outcomes, but they've got to take time from their grade 6 courses to be able to do that. So it's important for those teachers to know which are the outcomes that are critical for students to cover so that they'll be adequately prepared to have success in grade seven, and which are those outcomes that if they don't have the time to cover or if they only have the time to cover in cursory ways that they can allow for that to occur. Essentially, how they can prioritize those outcomes based upon what's necessary in the sequencing of the curriculum. Finally, departments of education should reconsider how they plan to implement standardized assessments for the 2020-21 school year. The Federal Department of Education allowed states to have a waiver for the 2019-2020 school year, and most, if not all, states took advantage of that. While the Department of Education at the federal level has not indicated that they're willing to do that for the 2020-21 school year, education is still controlled at the state level, and state departments of education are well within their authority to undertake those kinds of decisions and look at alternative forms of assessment and look at different ways to measure student learning. Turning our attention to the school districts, District leaders should have also provided early guidance to their school leaders. By early, if the departments were expected to provide guidance in May and June, the districts should have provided guidance in June and early July to their schools. If a school leader didn't have that guidance in hand by the middle of July, they really missed a lot of opportunity to be able to effectively plan for a fall reopening without that information. 
Second, the onus was up on school districts to begin to address the issue of digital equity. As we saw from the examples in the spring and what we've seen so far in the fall, one of the things that this pandemic has exposed in a very stark way is the simple fact that there is a real inequality in people's ability to access learning outside of the physical school building. This lack of access comes in two forms. The first is a lack of devices in the home, and the second is a lack of reliable internet that has speeds capable of allowing multiple devices to be used at the same time. In the case of remote learning, there is also the aspect of whether or not the student has a home situation that would allow them to be able to learn in the home environment as opposed to in the school. Now, no one expected that school districts would be able to solve the problems of digital equity over the summer. However, during the spring semester, we saw districts that used very creative ways in which to allow students to access their learning in non-digital formats. There were some jurisdictions that utilized the old correspondence materials, the departments of education or individual organizations within the state had access to. Many school districts made arrangements with local television stations to play educational programming throughout the school day or at specific points throughout the school day. Many school districts, as well as individual school leaders and teachers, actually prepared packets that could be sent or delivered to the home so that students were able to learn without having to sit in front of a screen. All of these things should have been a part of a plan that the school district put in place over the summer to address digital equity so that students would be in a position to be able to access their learning when school started in the fall. Next, it was important for school districts to begin to decide upon standardized tools across the district or at least across certain grade level bands within the district. For example, if we were to consider the use of a video-based discussion form, during the spring what we saw was that teachers would use whatever they were familiar with or whatever their students were comfortable with. So you might have some teachers that would be using Flipgrid for that purposes, other teachers that would be using VoiceThread for that purpose. More teachers might have used the discussion forum that was native to the learning management system like Canvas or Moodle that they were already using. However, what this meant was that parents and students had to be able to support three different systems. In some cases, if you could think of a high school student where you might have a science teacher that's using one tool, an English teacher that's using another tool, and a math teacher that's using a third tool. And in those instances, the student has to figure out how to use all of those things. The parents have to figure out how to support their children in their use of all of those things. And if the parent has more than one child within that school district, it multiplies the number of tools that they may have to support. So it was important for school districts to decide upon these are the specific tools that we are going to use for these particular functions. And then once they've decided upon those tools, now part of the process of deciding on those tools should have been interacting with their school leaders who were interacting with their teachers to find out what tools were being used, what tools afforded certain things, what limitations came with different tools, so that they could make an informed decision about both what teachers were comfortable with, but what also students and parents were reporting through their teachers and through their school leaders that were being used in effective ways during that spring remote learning. Now, when the district did decide to provide professional development on these standardized tools, they really wanted to provide it in three realms. The first realm was teaching the teachers how to use the tool. The second would be teaching teachers how to support the tool because in many cases in a remote learning context, the teacher becomes the first line in that help chain when a student or parent aren't able to get the tool to work. Finally, 
The third area that school districts needed to provide professional development was how to teach using the tool, because it's very different to be able to use the tool compared to being able to teach effectively with the tool. And too often times in education, we provide professional development on how to use the tool, but we really don't provide good professional development on how to teach with the tool. The third group that we see on this particular slide are the schools and school leaders. Prior to the end of the 2019-2020 school year, school leaders should have began the process of understanding the realities of the students and families that they serve. At this stage, we had a good idea of who our essential workers were. We also had a good idea of those that had the ability to work remotely and those who may be able to continue working remotely when school began in the fall. We had a good sense of the students that needed digital devices, the students that needed better broadband, and the onus was upon school leaders to begin to develop a plan using the guidance provided by the district and the Department of Education to address these issues. That might have involved working with their teachers on looking at ways in which the curriculum could be offered in non-digital ways. It could have been reaching out to community organizations to see if there were opportunities to partner with those groups to allow for students to come to a community or church hall and access their learning in a physically distanced way in a larger space than what the classroom might accommodate. It would have most certainly involved finding out from parents and guardians which students would need an alternative to home-based remote learning simply because of their family circumstance. And to approach those questions from the perspective of an equity context. The bottom line is that school leaders need to make decisions around these different contexts to ensure that everybody has access to the learning. As you can see from my description, the understanding the realities of the communities that they are serving and addressing the digital equi equity issues within those communities are closely tied together. Finally, school leaders needed to plan for and accommodate professional development for their teachers. In many cases, this should have involved working with the school districts to delay the school opening to allow teachers to come back in and to be able to create and curate materials for students to be able to use in their remote learning context, regardless if they were digital or some other form of instruction. Now, as many of us are well aware, much of what I've just described didn't actually happen. So the question becomes, well, what can we do about it now? Both within the K-12 system as well as within society as a whole, the first thing that we need to do is understand that this is a long-term situation that we find ourselves in. This past July, Dr. Teresa Tam, who is the Chief Public Health Officer of Canada, told Canadians that they should expect to live with the current inconveniences that they have been experiencing with the pandemic for the next two to three years. It was only a week and a half ago that Dr. Fauci in the United States said, I think it will be easily by the end of 2021 and perhaps even into the next year before we start having some semblances of normality. From a K-12 perspective, what this means is that we should expect that all of the 2020-21 school year, as well as even parts of the 21-22 school year, will be disrupted in the same manner that we see today. So the first and most important thing that I think we need to do as educators, as school leaders, as district leaders, and as policymakers is to be honest and realistic about how long we are in this particular situation. The next thing that we need to do is we need to make sure that school leaders address the morale issue amongst our teachers and our staff within our schools, because if we don't do that, our ability to address the morale that our students and their families feel will be significantly burdened. Another reality that we have to come to understand is the fact that while many of our teachers, in particular many of our young teachers, have grown up in a society that is pervasive with technology, the vast majority of them 
really don't know how to use that technology in effective ways, particularly in effective ways for the purposes of remote or distance learning. Interestingly, in fact, if you look at the amount of time both teacher preparation programs as well as online programs themselves spend on training teachers how to teach at a distance, the figures are actually quite small in nature. So it's important for school leaders and district leaders to provide that professional development. And if the professional development wasn't provided as part of the initial school opening planning, there needs to be steps taken right now to ensure that that professional development is available to teachers so that they're able to incorporate it into the things that they do with their students. Another thing that we need to consider, and this will actually go a long way in addressing teacher morale, is to look at how we've implemented these hybrid or flexible learning environments that we've created. What you see here on the screen is a typical model that's used by many school districts what days of the week that students are actually doing, which of those activities might vary. But if you have one teacher that's assigned to a class, and that class is divided into two groups, and the teacher teaches one group of those students on two days, and they teach the same material to a different group on two other days, and then they have three days of distance learning that they have to provide for both groups. If you add up those days, that equals up seven days worth of work that they need to find a way in which to accomplish within the five-day work week. One of the things school and district leaders can do to address the issues inherent in this model is to actually assign some teachers to only teach in the classroom and some teachers to only teach in a distance environment. That also allows the school and the district to target their professional development to those folks that most need it so that the professional development that's focused upon remote learning and remote learning tools and remote learning pedagogies are provided to the teachers that are actually doing the remote instruction. And then we can also provide professional development to the teachers who are teaching in the classroom because they're obviously teaching in a context that students aren't accustomed to finding themselves in. So it's important for those teachers to be able to accommodate that reality. In addition to the professional development that we would provide for teachers in this kind of model, or really in any model that would fall into that toggle semester that Brian Alexander was talking about, is to make sure that we provide some sort of orientation, some sort of training for our students and our parents. The families that our schools serve right now have a specific idea in mind of what it means to go to school. The students that we are serving all have some experience in what it means to attend school. And for many of them, they've learned how to have success in that traditional environment. Now we've put them into an environment that they don't have any experience in, and we haven't given them the skills and strategies that they will need in order to have success in that environment. We haven't provided parents and guardians with strategies and knowledge on how to help their children have success in that environment. So if you go back to our slide that had all of the things that should have happened, Really, with the exception of providing early guidance, all of the other things that are on that slide are still things that each of those different bodies could be doing. So that brings us to the end of my formal presentation. I look forward to interacting with you in the various forums that are part of this virtual conference. If you would like to reach out to me outside of the conference, you can see my contact information. You can see my contact information on this slide. Additionally, all of my social media channels are linked into the homepage that you find at the bottom. Thank you very much for your attention over the past 30 minutes or so, and I look forward to interacting with you.